Thank you, Madam President. President Zelensky, you have uh, you were just given a serious homework assignment. <laughs> uh, we're now for this is an extraordinary morning, and we're now going fortunate enough to to hear from the president of uh, Finland. Uh, he is in his uh, second term. He just won re-election to a second term. He is a uh, lawyer by, by, by training. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to hear from President Ninisto. Uh, for a few minutes, we'll make some remarks. Then I will uh, pose some uh, easy questions uh, to him. Mr. President, thank you very much. President Zelensky, President Kolyulaid, ladies and gentlemen, it's so touching to be here amongst uh, happy people and uh, free people. Mr. Sensov, somehow it was uh, a huge experience for me to see you alive, to hear you talking. Why? I have so many times taken up your case and fate in a totally different table. It's good to see you. As the theme of this conference is uh, happiness, I will, of course, have to begin by pointing out that Finland is considered to be the happiest country in the world. Well, we may not always look like that. But uh, we have uh, the World Happiness Report on the World Economic Forum to prove it. But comparing countries on something as intangible as happiness can sound odd or unserious. However, I believe that our number one position in that report has a lot to do with our success in several other rankings. We have consistently been in the top three in global indexes measuring, for instance, the rule of law, the level of education, the lack of cor corruption, and in 2019, Finland was also ranked as the least fragile state in the world. It is no co coincidence that these things go hand in hand, the rule of law, education, low, corrup low corruption, stability, and yes, happiness. It was not self-evident uh, when the journey of an independent Finland began that we would be able to enjoy these ingredients uh, of happiness a hundred years later. Not only did we start as a poor rural country, we also went through a brutal and bloody civil war only a few months after gaining independence. And yet, we became a stable democracy that withstood all the challenges of the 20th century. A competitive modern economy fully integrated into global markets a society prepared to pull together. Ladies and gentlemen, this transformation could not have happened without uh, the proper structures. Earlier this week in Helsinki, we celebrated uh, the centenary of our Constitution Act. This Constitution of 1919 turned Finland into a republic a republic with strong institutions and strong fundamental rights for its uh, citizens. Luckily, we had, uh, have had an uninterrupted run with this solid form of government for a full century now. It is an invaluable foundation for the way we lead our lives today. But uh, structures are not enough. Even the best of constitutions is not sufficient to guarantee a functioning society. It can only provide a framework. 
In order to fill that framework with content, the society itself, the people themselves, have to take responsibility for it. For me, two key characteristics of the Finnish society stand out. One is trust. The other is feeling of belonging. Maybe President Zelensky said it in other words, uh, feeling to be present. Both of these elements require citizens to understand that they are not only having rights, but also responsibilities. Other people's rights have always to be respected, not just one's own. A society where people trust each other, a society people genuinely feel that they belong to, despite their differences, is also a society that is more resilient against external threats. This is at the heart of our concept of comprehensive security. For our strong national defense, military capabilities, of course, continue to matter. They make the threshold against the potential aggressor higher and they make us into a more interesting partner for others. But in a world of hybrid warfare and alternative facts, other, less material assets are increasingly important too. I have often said that each citizen is a defender of his or her country, between his ears at least what you accept, what you understand being false. That is important. Since I have uh, talked at length about uh, the Finnish experience, allow me to make one thing clear. I'm deeply reluctant to give unsolicited, uh, unsolicited uh, advice to anyone. Our own society is far from perfect. It too requires constant nurturing and improvement. But if there is an international interest in some kind of Finnish model, this is the story I'm always happy to share. At least for us, it has worked reasonably well. Now, let me widen the perspective from the case of Finland to larger geopolitical questions. I'm sure that we will go deeper into them in the discussion that follows. In fact, I believe that the same elements I highlighted earlier, trust and feeling of belonging, are also vital components of a functioning international order. Even the best of institutions, even the best of treaties and agreements are not enough if the members of the international community all of us are not willing to respect them. The framework has to be filled with content. It is our responsibility as states, as global citizens. At the moment, unfortunately, we are not fulfilling our responsibility. Precisely when a growing number of truly global challenges would urgently call for common responses. The rules-based international order is crumpling in front of our eyes. Multilateralism is overshadowed by great power competition. Confrontation prevails over cooperation. Unpredictability and disorder are gaining the upper hand. Amid uh, gloomy future scenarios, the good news is that uh, there is nothing inevitable about them. The moderator of this uh, session, Richard Haas, will recognize this quote, quote from his uh, book, uh, World of Disraeli. The rationale for statecraft, diplomacy, and foreign policy more broadly is that the nature of the international order, the balance between anarchy and society, can be changed for the better. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is the business we are in, statecraft, diplomacy, and foreign policy. This is what we <coughs> collectively have to strive for, changing the balance for the better again. More society, less anarchy. We have to rebuild the trust that has been lost. We have to reconstruct the feeling of belonging and understanding that the problems of the 21st century require global solutions. I do not have any illusions about the difficulty of this task. Saving the international order will require a lot of hard work. It will be frustrating at times, and we will also suffer setbacks. But uh, we don't really have a better alternative. We must try. One thing is certain. We can't possibly succeed in this task without diplomacy, without uh, dialogue. Joining forces with like-minded friends and partners in defending the international order makes its voice stronger. But we do not have the luxury of engaging those with whom we already agree. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I look forward for discussing more. Uh, yesterday, while talking with uh, President uh, Zelensky, he made a challenge. He said that uh, in years to come, Ukraine will be the happiest country in the world instead of Finland. Well, I welcome you to competition. It's a friendly, optimistic comp competition. Thank you. Mr. President, uh, thank you for those comments. Let me also just say that President Inistu, I think, has really distinguished himself. Uh, anyone who has the job of president has a pretty busy life and a pretty full inbox. But his speeches have regularly and consistently painted on a larger canvas. And you heard some of it this morning about the state of the world and the state of world order. So I, I thank you for for doing that. And actually, I wanted to follow up on, on some of the things you've written about and, and talked about. One thing you said is that it's very difficult to imagine solving global crises without uh, Russian participation. And the question I would have is, what, if any, reason do we have to believe that Russia is prepared to, to again, to use another phrase of yours, to join an international community as opposed to being an outsider actually trying to, in many cases, weaken what international community there is? Well, this is an issue we have been talking at least since uh, Crimea. Uh, there were voices saying that, uh, well, after sanctions, the Russian economy will collapse and they will crawl back. That hasn't happened. And I'm afraid it doesn't happen in the nearby future. Uh, what we have to try to do, well, we have a living example here when, uh, when the presidents uh, Putin and uh, Zelensky have been able to uh, agree on changing the prisoners. It's a minor step, and maybe it doesn't lead to anything, but nevertheless, it's a step. And, uh, we need little things to build up greater. If we immediately put a target that, well, it's yes or no, black or white, we will fail. But trying to walk little by little to the end, that, that would be it. Uh, I am quite worried about European Union because uh, I would like to see rectangle again well, I explain you what I mean by that. I draw a geopolitical map a couple of years ago. It was a rectangle with uh, Brussels, Washington, Beijing, Moscow. Now I draw it again, and for reasons, uh, it was only a triangle anymore without Brussels. And I have the very deep understanding that uh, having Europe on board again 
would also uh, be a positive thing to geopolitical developments. Thank you. Uh, I want to read another quote of yours back to you. I, it's always unfair to read people's quotes back to them, but I will. Uh, we have in our hands a host of wicked global problems that no single state or country can solve alone. I agree with you. So I, what do we do, though, when you, we have a single country that is not only not helping to solve a problem, but is making it worse? Let's take the case of Brazil. We just had the G7 meeting in France. The G7 offered $22 million to Brazil to help deal with the fires in the Amazon rainforest. Brazil denounced the offer as a colonialist uh, move, and meanwhile, the rainforest is, is disappearing at a, at a faster rate. What is the world to do? Because what happens in the rainforest is not simply going to affect Brazil. It's going to affect all of us. Well, if Brazil won't meet its obligations to act responsibly, what are the rest of us meant to do? Yes, um, actually, basically, it's a very difficult problem. Like we have heard uh, from Brasilia, they are there. They own the <laughs> Amazon and keep away from there. Uh, I think that maybe there was a minor mistake when uh, uh, we started with a huge attack towards Brasilia. And they, well, they defended uh, double that much, but taking it up uh, like in the UN, during the UN week, in a, would I say, more peaceful way, we are discussions. I think that that might have an impact. And at the end, surely, the international uh, institutions uh, can also, let's say, put some negative uh, sanctions on if uh, needed. But um, it is a bit difficult to get into another country telling them not to do or uh, yes to do. Uh, I was amazed, uh, even I proposed that we should uh, build up uh, uh, global system where we try to help each other if, uh, for ex instance, forest fires, also in other catastrophes, which, like you said, have an impact to everyone, everyone in the world. Uh, but even this didn't seem to fit Brazilian opinions. That's a disappointment. You made several references today to the so-called rules-based or liberal world order which grew out of the Second World War, and it's the, the rules, the institutions, and so forth that have brought actually unprecedented stability and prosperity and freedom over the last 75 years. And then even though this is a conference under the theme of happiness, you said, and you were quite blunt, that this order is crumbling. Uh, one of the reasons it's crumbling is the country that arguably did the most to create and sustain the world order, my own, the United States, no longer seems terribly interested uh, in it. And in many cases, actually now, the President of the United States seems more interested in disrupting it than sustaining it. So if that is the case, what is the rest of the world to do? What can Europe do? What, what can others do if the United States essentially, for the time being, is no, no longer willing to play the role it's played for three quarters of a century. First of all, to rule of law, you might have how fine, intelligent rule of law, whatever, but if people don't respect it, it's of no use. So I would once again point out attitudes, how people feel belonging to society, then they also respect the rules, and now I mean society globally, and uh, trusting that others play in the same way. That is trust. But uh, back to states, uh, on the other hand, I understand that, for example, on a state level, Americans are doing a lot, similar things that, uh, for example, we Europeans 
uh, want to be taken on climate change. I have experiences on uh, your president too. I would say that he's mm, tough with his headlines. But if you try to get put aside the headline, don't take it up, but take the issues from, <laughs> from uh, the portfolio, he's uh, a lot more constructive discusser. Uh, let's talk about Europe for a second. Uh, I haven't read Twitter or the newspapers in the last half hour, so I don't know what the latest is with Brexit. Uh, but we do have the challenge posed by Brexit. Uh, and then more broadly, we have the continuing turmoil politically in Italy. We have some of the uncertainty about what you might call post-Merkel uh, Germany and so forth. Uh, is there any reason now to feel confident that the, the European project in 10 years will be better than it is now, will be stronger than it is now? Well, let's hope so. Actually, we Europeans made a mistake in the beginning of this millennium. I attended then uh, summits and uh, the spirit was that, well, we are the best in the world. That said, that's true. And uh, there was a feeling of being overwhelming in a way. Now there's a wake-up call for Europe. And what comes to these political movements, uh, we always see you know, waves going. We are not maybe now in the best possible place but um, in that uh, storm. But uh, nevertheless, we have seen also, like in Finland, populistic parties which were against Europe and European Union, but now changed their view and saying that we just want a better European Union. Uh, let's hope that such kind of development uh, takes place and we, we will be on the top of the wave once again. You just mentioned the populist movements in Europe. Well, there's two other populist movements or three others that are quite interesting because they go the other way. We're seeing in Turkey the elections in Ankara and Istanbul, we're seeing populism against the government uh, in Ankara against Mr. Erdogan. In Russia, we've seen the recent local elections and we've seen people in the streets and populism is raising questions about Mr. Putin's continued rule. And in China, we're seeing a significant percentage of the seven million people of Hong Kong, again, demanding much greater freedoms and greater autonomy uh, than the government in Beijing seems to, to want. So is it possible that the populism we're seeing around the world is in many ways just against the status quo? And when the status quo is authoritarian, populism can be, to, could be a good thing. Uh, I'm here kind of a development optimist. And uh, I even believe that those um, governments you described, they have to take notice to elements what's taking place in, in the streets of their uh, cities and how to react on that. Uh, we have seen reactions, uh, you know, something here in Ukraine about that. When you give an answer by force, that doesn't work actually. And uh, my optimism is based on the fact that uh, uh, the more and more in those uh, governments uh, which are autocratic, they understand that this is not the way to, go, to save the face, but give room to democracy. And, uh, well, we have seen also democratic uh, developments in certain countries changing in democracy in a peaceful way. I wanted to raise another question about China. Uh, China has made significant inroads around the world with its Belt and Road Initiative funding infrastructure projects. We're beginning to see signs of it in Europe. What is your sense of what ought to be the relationship between Europe and China uh, more broadly? Uh, it is very interesting. We all remember President Xi in Davos when he took up that we, China and Europe, are the protectors of uh, free market 
uh, we are uh, market ec economic countries, and we are protecting together the environment. Well, There's a word that, for that in, in Yiddish called chutzpah, but, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> That's, uh, I admit, a couple of years ago. Have we seen it in concrete terms? That's a different case. And um, surely, if uh, we see Russia using uh, power, hard power, we see China using financial power, and we see the states using both of them to a certain extent. So uh, money is, uh, well, kind of a strong weapon because uh, people are not uh, that prepared to say no if they are offered a lot of money. And that is how actually, actually we have seen several countries where I think that uh, purchases of uh, infrastructure has gone quite far, gone quite, quite far already. I recently had a conversation like this with the head of the American FBI, and we were talking about Russian attempts to influence democracy in the United States particularly, but also we've seen it in, in, in Europe. And when he described what, the, what Russia did in the United States in 2016 and 2018, the phrase to use, it was a dress rehearsal for what the Russians are doing now and will do in 2020. So what, is, what, is, what are you doing in your country to reduce your vulnerability to Russian attempts to influence democracy in Finland? And is it enough for us to play defense? Are there things we should all be, whether Ukraine, the United States, Finland, Estonia, are there things we have to do besides making ourselves less vulnerable to deter Mr. Putin and others from trying to influence our democracies? First of all, Finland, um, well, we have a long history living uh, as a neighbor of Russia. It's not very beautiful history during the centuries. Uh, so I guess that, um, like I said, uh, I refer to that. Every citizen is a defender of his or her country, at least between the years. And I mean that what kind of information you accept, what you don't accept. And um, now back to Finnish uh, tradition from history, I think that people are so careful, they don't believe. And that's why, actually, we haven't seen very many attempts either from Russia, not very many attempts. Uh, those, uh, whether Russian-led or Finnish-Russian uh, uh, like us, who made them, people mo mostly laugh at it. So it's not uh, very efficient. But uh, what we are doing together is uh, uh, in hybrid warfare, we have uh, one problem. We do not know what all it uh, consists of. You every day almost find a new way you can call that's hybrid warfare. Uh, so we have to, to, together, we have to concentrate not only how to stop the existing elements of hybrid warfare, but also trying to make fictions what is possible and so that we would have the answer ready before anything happens. I'm getting the look. Uh, do I have time for one more question? No, I do not. Okay. Then, I have, then I've got two things to do. One is, again, I want to thank you and the President of Estonia, the President of Ukraine for, for being with us this morning and for being so thoughtful and so candid. It's, uh, for an American coming here, it's, it's actually exciting and it's reassuring to see such quality and leadership and such thoughtful leadership emerging in, in modern uh, Europe. And it's also, I think, a real tribute to, to Victor and to the people associated with YES that all of you have taken time out of your schedules to, uh, to come here. So thank you uh, for being here, sir, Madam President, Mr. President, and Victor, thank you.